So we looked at that and then also the community is the epicentre of change. So we have to have community engagement and involvement and uh, an understanding of what everyone can achieve to reduce their carbon footprint within the community. And then this all led into the action plan uh, um, along with the uh, input as well from council experts and planning experts. So we look at what are the drivers for a low carbon future. Well, essentially it's to reduce our carbon footprint. And also with reducing carbon footprint comes reduced cost of energy. And also looking at how the community can actually own their own energy generation. So they can actually become stakeholder in their own energy generation and actually get the money uh, back into the community from doing that. And also it looks at the security of energy supply. At the moment, we've got really high energy costs, a very volatile energy market. You know, we've seen prices going up and up and up, and that's only going to go one way. And to give, give the community some kind of security in knowing that they've got some control over their own energy supply in the future. And also the reduction of fuel poverty. Um, fuel poverty tends to come um, when these three things collide. So you have increasing energy prices on the left. You have poor building fabric, so buildings that haven't got cavities so you can't easily insulate them. They're really hard to bring the costs of energy down. And then you've got either low or stagnant income. Um, and we see inflation going up, but uh, wages are stagnating. So we're all feeling the pinch on energy prices. And if you have those three things then, if fuel poverty is plus, if, if you're spending 10% of your, of your income on fuel, then that's kind of the cutoff for fuel poverty. So when we looked at the S Valley, we, we looked at the seven different parishes, uh, which uh, are, are quite <coughs> right here, I'm sure you all know where they are. Uh, but we thought it was quite important to actually have it in a parish by parish uh, format so people can have the epicentre of their change um, in a nucleated ground map parish. So looking at the energy benchmarking, uh, the government collects a lot of data uh, and it's all set out in parishes. So we, we're able to extract the data for the S Valley for electrical consumption and gas consumption. However, here, obviously a lot of people are off the gas grid so we've had to make some assumptions that 30% of people are on the gas grid and 70% of people are off the gas grid in the S Valley. Um, but we were able to look at uh, the actual capacity of the energy demand. So I think we've, I think we've made good assumptions on that. Um, generally, you can see the trend here at the top, that's the average gas consumption. So you can see it's coming down as people do tend to insulate more now. Whereas electricity consumption is marginally gone down, but it's pretty level. And, and these are approximately average for the UK, so the S Valley residents have similar usage to the rest of the country. So this is looking at the total heat demand in this area. And um, as you can see, all the green is domestic heat use. So as you can see, there's, there's not much uh, of industry using heat, it's, it's mostly domestic. Uh, heat consumption in this area and it, it requires a capacity of 28 megawatts. So that's quite large when you think about renewable energy and how you're going to meet a percentage of that demand with renewables. So currently uh, we've done uh, an assessment of the installed capacity, so what renewable energy we've got, you've got actually installed in the S Valley and what percentage that meets of the total energy demand. Okay. Yeah. So you said the last question. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah. feel free to interject. Sorry. How do you put What the percentage uh, of installed capacity? Yeah. This, this one. Yeah. Uh, well, we just looked at the installed capacity that's in, in, embedded in the community. So, so oh, so we looked at things like the fit register and um, the records. Um, from Ofgen, and um, it is hopefully it captures most of it. Things that are there prior to this, it, it's it's not concrete. It's 
it's the best we could do, really. Um, we've got some, obviously, in the bottom village, they sent us what they've got, and um, it's, it's, the best, it's the best fit that we can get, really, by looking at all the data available. Um, and then we looked at the total energy demand, and you could probably just see electrical demand, I think it was 1.58% is met by renewables currently, and heat demand was about 1% currently is met by renewables. So it's, it's Can, yep. sorry, but the previous slide you talked about gas grid in the S Valley. I'm not aware of any gas uh, slides. Slides. Really? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It only goes as far as slides. Oh, okay. So that's what we we assume that thirty percent is on the gas grid and seventy okay. percent is off. Right. So it is again it's one of those things we've had to make an assumption but as long as we kind of detail why we make that assumption and looking at kind of the 28 megawatt heat capacity um, and the number of households, I think, I think we've, we've, we've got that. And the know, 28 megawatts is, is the peak requirement? That is the peak requirement on, yeah, on the deck. So as you can see, it's quite, quite a small percentage at the moment is met by renewables, but I should also say that that's actually quite good compared to a lot of other areas where they've got even less than that. But it does show that when you think that the government have targets whereby we're to meet 30% of our electrical demand by renewables by 2020 and 12% peak demand, then there's clearly a long way to go. Which, which is renewables? Sorry, is it black? Sorry. Uh, yes, it's at the bottom. I'm sorry, sorry. Wind speed. We looked at the squares that had the highest wind speed and then we looked at 
Google, this is on Google Maps, yeah. so obviously there's limitations. Yeah. Um, Google so then we looked at uh, where there's uh, a population near that square, so if there's going to be likely to be a good connection, and just have a look on Street View and things like that to see if there's any immediate constraints. So again, it is an approximation, but we were more conservative than um, Cavalier, I'd say, with, with our approximations. Right. Um, so we came up from the renewable energy facility. We thought that there'd be 27 six kilowatt turbines. Um, we looked at PV arrays on various south facing buildings. So they're all detailed in the feasibility, um, which gave the total, as you can see, of the megawatt hours that could be generated. And then we thought that perhaps 50, if 50 residences actually took. Um, a, installed biomass boilers, then say a big care home like the Eskimo care home installed biomass. So we just picked out things that we thought were feasible. Ground floor seat pumps, if 10 residents actually installed ground floor seat pumps, if air floor seat pumps were introduced into 20 residences, then we totted up these figures to see how that would meet the targets that the government have set. Could you not find any water source heat pumps? We did, we put something about water source heat pumps in there. Well, but I saw that on a previous yeah, slide, well, we've not, on this list. No, no, well, we didn't actually look at a particular property that we thought, well, that could be perfect for water source heat pumps, because there's much more constraints around water source heat pumps. And because the, the, this is an overview, it would have been great to come again and do another site visit and actually find a property that we think, oh, that could be good for water source heat pumps. But it's been very much uh, an overview, looking from desk on Google Maps to see where we could do things. Um, so it, yeah, it, it does need more detail, and hopefully this will be the next step for the project. Will be to pick out things that we think well, we should look at the sites for all sorts of heat pumps. Yeah, sorts of things. You, you, you put uh, ten residences, ground floor heat pumps as, as a goal. Well, well, well I mean, but we that's already well. Well, yeah, we've looked, at we've looked at the ones that are installed already, so this is in people, another 10 residents. So we've been quite conservative okay, yeah. with, our, with our estimates, um, but then we've built the case, uh, this is the baseline, basically, and then we've looked at, well, how many, do, how many, how many ground floor seat pumps need to be installed to meet these targets? You, you initially talked about 28 uh, megawatts of capacity being required. We've now got megawatt hours, that's presumably per year. So on the electricity side, how many uh, kilowatts or megawatts does that equate to in terms of capacity? Because I don't really have a feel for how much that is uh, providing you towards your 28, kilowatt, 28 megawatt goal. Well, I've looked at the 28 megawatt capacity. I, that was just kind of a headline. Yeah. In, in the feasibility, in the, in the strategy, we've got it in capacity and generation. But here, I'm just kind of looking at the generation. So we looked at the demand that is actually, the energy demand that's consumed. So what sort of percentage is this? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, right, so, um, so right, we looked at the current install capacity, so here we've got what, what's in there now, and then we looked at the potential renewable energy, which is in the previous slide. So this, this, this we were thinking, well, if 10 people did air source heat pumps, um, if 20 people did air source heat pumps, if 10 people did ground source and that's what we get. Then we looked at the current energy demand and looked at the percentage of that we So if we installed the uh, technologies that I just suggested in the previous slide, then electricity would then meet 3.42% of, of, uh, of the electric electrical demand would be met by renewable energy, and 8.42% would be met by the heat demand would be met by renewable energy. So it's gone some way to meeting, uh, you know, reaching those targets. But if you remember, the target for renewable energy of electrical was thirty percent, and heat was twelve percent. So it's still quite a long way off, really. So we then thought, well, actually, we're also looking at reducing the energy demand of the community. So we're looking at reducing, uh, you know, insulating, uh, upgrading single glazing to double glazing, and how that will reduce the energy demand. So if you consider the energy demand reduced by 40%, which is quite a, quite a, a mean feat, really, 
burn the electrical percentage is 5.7% met by renewables and heat jumps to 14%. This over a 10-year period? This, this is probably at the 10-year period. So, yes, reducing energy demand by 40% would take quite a long, a big rollout of, you know, insulating and, um, you know, looking at glazing and actually uh, funding that as well. Uh, so, again, you can see, though, that they're really way off the targets that the government want to, want us to meet. So, this is what we've got existing at the moment. Can you see that? It's a bit small, isn't it? This is the current mix of the technologies that we've got at the moment. So, there's basically hydro, PV, small scale wind, solar thermal, biomass, ground source heat pump, and air source heat pump. And we scale those up in, in stages to see how much we need to meet to actually meet the government targets. So, in our feasibility, as you can see, recommended projects from feasibility, that's where we came out from our feasibility. We, we thought we were being conservative, but, but actually probably quite realistic. And then we looked at, well, actually, we need to do a lot more to, to meet these targets. Um, as you can see, the biggest bit is the blue, and that's biomass. Uh, if we then reduced the energy demand and jumped up to um, in increase the uh, biomass and we actually hear, I think it's so 18%. It? So 18% of electrical demand would be met by renewables and 12% Then if you look at the business case for renewable energy, we, we then think about, well, it's all very well saying well, you, you, you need to increase your renewables, but it's how do you find how do you find the one that's most cost effective? And um, just looking at, at the breakdown of how much you spend to, for one kilowatt of installed capacity, um, biomass, single building heating comes out way cheaper than, than any of the other technologies. So just, I'll just pause before I go on to this one. Yeah. It's a very silly question, so forgive me, but a lot of lectures I've been to um, say biomass is the answer. On the basis of supply and demand, what's this going to do to the value of buying wood energy? If the S Valley took up biomass, well, assuming the S Valley was a microcosm of what happened across the rural countryside of the UK, yeah. I'm just looking at the number of trees there are, mm. I'm looking at the number of times biomass is given as the answer, yeah. and I'm wondering if you're getting to the case that the value of a tree per firm burnt, or whatever mm. we call it now, um, actually will start escalating quite quickly as demand starts to it outstrips supply. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that if everyone was turning to biomass in their droves, then it could be a problem. But at, at the moment, certainly, and in the future, it would have to be, have an exponential increase of, uh, in people consuming biomass. And really, while there's a gas grid, and you know, I think we need to look much more at how we heat, we look at Scandinavian models of district heating, and city centres should be looking at district heating using waste process heat from large industry and utilising different types of heat to rural economies. I think rural areas must get off coal and oil because they're held to ransom at the moment anyway, and you know, volatile energy prices. And I think there's, there's enough of a commodity of wood pellets or wood chips to feed the rural areas with biomass and I think the city centres should have different solutions to the same problem. So I agree that it could be a sustainability problem in the long term, but at present and in the next 10 years, I don't think the supply and demand will be a problem. Because it's about, for my good friend here, it's about eight tonnes 
per year to heat your, you know, modern three, four bedroomed house. That's quite a lot of trees. That's one big logs, big logs, logs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that again brings the point that we need to reduce our energy demand. Um, and with renewable energy, I think that's the key thing before any renewables are installed is to reduce the energy demand of a home, uh, of a business, um, and actually get that to a baseline before spending the money and actually installing anything. Um, but speaking about biomass and, and it kept, what, what has come out of the feasibility study for me has been understanding how hard it is for communities to actually reach this government target of how much energy they need to generate through renewables. And often in communities there are easy wins, you know, a couple of big wind turbines or some kind of um, district heating system, whereas the S Valley is quite constrained in that in that respect. And but one thing that is clear is there is a huge heat demand. And because there are so many buildings that are hard to clusters hard to treat, so they can't be easily insulated with cavity wall. Um, I think it's a big challenge to reduce the energy demand and then try and meet it in a more sustainable way. And I think that has to be with individual biomass boilers. So we were then discussing how does this how can it be financed and how can the community actually take out their existing uh, fossil fuel boilers and replace them? And I think cooperatives are a great way of actually doing that. And if there's an investment pot and, and the community actually own the investment pot and make money from the returns that the Renewable Heat Incentive will bring in October 2012. But so far, the Renewable Heat Incentive hasn't actually come into play, and that won't be until October, uh, alongside the Green Deal. So, so we're looking at financing <coughs> the Greens. So the Green Deal is coming is a government, um, government scheme to help people reduce their energy demand in their buildings, their heat energy demand in their buildings. And the idea is it's called a pay-as-you-save and uh, the, you have no upfront capital cost and you basically get uh, your insulation or your double glazing uh, free and then the money you save on your energy bill is then paid to the um, company that's installed. So it's, it's due to happen in October and hopefully it will be all on the website when it comes. Yes, yeah, so I think the idea is, is if we can keep you updated on what's going on, because this isn't accessible at the moment, but if everyone's up to date and up to speed on what it is, what's it's about, then when it does launch in October, then people have an idea of how they can access it. So it's an, it's an advice service initially, and then the house gets green deal assessed, and it's determined whether um, it's... The two, there's two parts here. We've got the ECO, which is the Energy Company Obligation, and the Golden Rule. Basically, the Golden Rule is for buildings that are more modern and eas more easily insulated. So it means that they will pay off. If, if they put in capital wall insulation, then the savings they will make will pay off that capital investment over the 20-year duration of that loan, that free loan. The loan stays with the house, not with the person. However, if that golden rule can't be met, then it becomes the ECO. And it basically, sorry, I've got one the people who have hard to treat homes, which are going to be really expensive to upgrade. So things like solid walls, things like uh, houses that are in conservation areas where you can't just go and replace the windows with UPVC double glazing. They're going to be really expensive homes to upgrade and they come under the hard to treat homes and the carbon saving obligation. For those people who are fuel vulnerable, i.e. people that could be in fuel poverty, they, they come under the affordable warmth obligation. So this, this doesn't really affect the homeowner because the Green Deal assessor will actually de decide which part of that home is going to go down and they will set up a plan according to what works needs.
need to be done on their own to bring them up to a certain standard. And all this is going to be um, overseen by, there's going to be a code of practice, a quality mark, and an oversight body. Um, so the people who come and do the assessing and the people who do the loans are all going to be accredited. So this is the plan for October. It's not up and running yet, but when it is, it's, I think, hopefully, that we'll, we'll be ready to, ready, you'll be informed and ready to go with this. So before you move on, yeah. what are the obligations in this sense? You've got the carbon saving obligation. Obligation on whom to do what? For the energy companies. Right. Um, and for the energy companies paying to it and the, and the government. So but some people have an obligation to support people, say, with hard to heat homes in making them easier to heat. Yes. Is that what you're yeah, the, the energy companies. Um, the big six energy companies are having to, they're, they're obliged to help those people who have hard to treat homes or are fuel vulnerable to actually make their energy costs lower by upgrading their homes. So is that a then there will be providing grants, like the grants are provided for more insulation, but more insulation at the moment? Well, it, it kind of works. It's a bit like... <coughs> The, the, the house takes on a loan, really. Um, so if you move house, that loan stays with the house. And the loan is paid off by the fuel savings you have in your energy bill. So say, for example, you're paying £100 a month, which sounds a bit cheap actually these days, but £100 a month on your energy bill. And then you have uh, your walls, are, solid walls are insulated, and um, you, know, you have your loft insulated and double glazing and your bill's reduced to £50 a month. But you'll continue to pay £100 a month, and that £50 will go, the money that you're saving will go to pay off this loan that's on your house. So if you have no upfront capital cost, um, and it means that if you did move house, you, you're not taking that burden with you. So, so the assessor comes along, looks at the property, and puts together a green deal plan for that property, yeah. and this is what we think we can do. It won't cost you any more when you're paid off in eight years or whatever. Yes, that's right. But you don't, you're, not, you're not obliged to, if they say to you, this is the list of recommendations we make, and you say, well, actually, I don't want that, I don't want that, then that's fine. You can, you can, you can, pick, you can make your plan for the house. Yeah. Right, a few questions. Like, James, did you have a point personal? Yeah. Because James and Kate are just getting their head round all of this, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm James Bridges as a sustainable resource for Scarborough Borough Council. Um, I mean, so the actual policy content of Green Deal is, is not there at the moment, it's still quite ambiguous, so we're only getting ideas about how, how we're actually taking forwards. Um, in terms of carbon saving obligation, at the moment, there, there, are, there are carbon saving obligations on energy providers for, for example, things like the community energy saving scheme, and something called CERT, that's why you get free insulation at the moment for lofty cavity insulation, because energy companies have an obligation to fund energy measures to reduce carbon emissions. So in terms of eco, which is seen as more, is bringing all those, eco is bringing all those energy obligation funding streams together, if you like. So eco will, as I understand it, will capture, um, will, will, will capture hard to keep homes. It's going to cost a lot more, a lot more to, than the one that would be able to afford through, through, through the standard golden rule package, because it might cost like £8,000, for example, for a free bedroom home for solid wall insulation. Um, it would be very hard to pay that very hard to pay that back through the savings you've made on your energy bill, which would fund the golden rule. Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> what what happens if, if um, the example you give, your you, your energy bill is hundred pounds, you did the work and theoretically it should be down to fifty, but somebody else moved into the house so actually profitable with their energy on there as it turns that turn right up. And so there's still Use the 100 quid's worth of energy, where would the extra 50 quid come from? I would never pay 150 energy bills in order to pay off 50 quid to pay off the work that's being done and the 100 pounds to pay well, off the energy if, bills. If that was the case, you, you wouldn't be paying anything because you only pay the amount you save. But it brings up a really valid point that actually there's no sure. obligation on that customer who lives in the house to just go, oh, well, I've, I've made those savings, I might as well. You know, live in my shorts in winter. So, so, so what, 
the, 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 so the end is going to get nothing back then? Yeah, basically. It's only, it's only on the right. money you saved. I mean, they might well come and knock on the door and say, why aren't you saving anything? <laughs> and you're in your flip-flops. So. <laughs> As I, as I see it, the Green Deal is all about a loan. Hard to treat homes, you probably won't save enough to pay for the loan. So you wouldn't take it out in the first place. So I don't quite see how it can work for hard to treat homes, where you have to invest a lot of money to save a little. Yeah, but that, that, that's why it kind of comes under this golden rule, because it's not going to be paid off. So there are these two classes of hard to treat and the fuel vulnerable, and they're just treated as upgrades. So the, you will be making savings on your bill, so you will be saying you're paying some of it back, but it's just a hit that the energy companies and the government are oh, okay. taking, because they, to them, reducing your energy demand for our terribly inefficient housing stock has got to be done. So it's, they are getting some money back, but... But not enough to pay off But not, I mean, long right. term... So they're then, funding it, basically. So to charging everybody else. Yes, yeah, uh, and uh, it's in their interest because long term, you know, when <coughs> well, uh, they need to get the energy down. Yeah. So. Mm, so you want that sort of thing? Yeah, just, what, just to add, also, I mean, if you're, if you're in a hard tree home and you're working with your property, eco would essentially cover some of those costs as well. If that makes sense, because it's, it's like a grant, as I understand it, eco is. So that's so some money would be put towards helping you to to do the hard tree home. If, if, you want, if, you, if you ask if you're probably in one certain, certain criteria of being that might be vulnerable. Okay. So, so the clever thing is to buy a house from someone who's done this, and then when the old couple move out, who've been paying £80 a month, and you move in with your four children, then you're actually going to get you're quite a, a cheap home to run. Well, I suppose your energy bill will still be, I mean, if you're paying more because you're using more energy, you'll be paying more money. So, but yeah, you won't be paying back the loan, essentially. It's actually going to have a wonderfully distorting effect on the price of houses. Mm. Well, I suppose people are, are going to look more, as energy prices continue to go up, people look more at the, at the energy performance of, of a home. So that might be fair then. So this, is, this is a good yeah. uh, energy saving house, therefore its capital value is higher.
solar and wind turbines which don't have any emissions. So we thought we need to think a bit more about that. And also with biomass, supply of wood, land for trees, land shouldn't be taken off food production to grow trees. Um, what happens if wood becomes so expensive that biomass becomes unviable? Things like that. A bit negative, doesn't it? <laughs> um, number two, priority should be to reduce peak demand and education for people how to get the message out, how they can save money. And number three, what should be avoided? The biomass. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we, we did have um, some uh, rounded thoughts. Um, on the renewable energy technologies, what we looked at really was space and water heating, bearing in mind that for an average family, up to half of all energy used is for domestic hot water heating. And then we looked to see whether the, if you like, the availability was either the person had capital or they wanted a revenue stream, because that does actually uh, push you in different directions. On the capital base, um, unlike our good friends over there, we thought in the short term, then wood chip log biomass, that was capital-wise a cheap uh, place to go first, and would do both central heating and domestic hot water. Um, but in, if, you, if you have a reasonable capital base, then for those duties, uh, the best revenue ones are, first of all, water source heat pumps, then ground source heat pumps, and finally air source heat pumps in doing those duties. So that was ours. And slightly bizarrely, what should be the first priority um, in, the, in the next 12 months? Um, we put something that hadn't been discussed, and that was draft proofing. Because in the very... Base, oh, sorry. <laughs> in the very basic sort of um, SAP, if you like, calculation we did on our property, a worst case scenario, which was minus 10 outside, we wanted it 20 degrees inside, the calculation showed that about four of the eight kilowatts required was on heating the air changes. So before you do any capital spending, um, then actually stopping the drafts will significantly decrease the amount of energy you expend in heating all those intrusive streams of air. So that was ours. Um, what should be avoided, we said, beware wind. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> the basis. Um, on, the basis of, okay, on the basis of topography, round here anyway, planning, but we thought ridge blade if we were going to go wind anywhere, would be the best option if that ever comes to fruition. Um, how important are targets? Um, after looking at what happened with PV and the 170,000 people that tried to put PV in in the last month or whatever it was, <laughs> we thought rather um, cynically that people are largely motivated by money. <laughs> <laughs> so any targets that are financial for people will gain traction. I mean, we have a perfect example in PV that, that you know, the country just took that on board because there was money there. How important are targets? Oh, that's that one. Um, on the subgroups, we thought it was probably better that it was better to have a multifunctional group looking holistically at a single prospect, if you like. So if you've got a hard to heat home, if you've sort of got the biomass fringe and the heat pump fringe and the draft proofing fringe, you know, sorry, that's not going to get anywhere. Look at how they run the electricity grids nowadays. So the best thing is probably to have a team that has wisdom in most of those who can go in and look and say, best thing for you to do is do this first and then second. And you can look holistically at the whole thing rather than champion a particular one. Um, 
should we have, oh, should we reassess pros, progress or something? I said why not, but why not? Um, the workshop was how should we, or yes. who should? Um, the follow-up is important. <laughs> it was late last night. <laughs> Wait, which one was it? <laughs> oh, okay, right. Um, the follow-up is important, but we sort of said, given that most of the things around here run on voluntary people, it will happen if people are inspired. It won't if they're not. So, that's, sorry, that's just a truism. Um, the one thing that the team added um, from experience that we've, we've had in terms of reduction of energy consumption is those people who have double glazing and it's starting to fog or they want to put in double glazing, there are some choices and probably if you can, the best one to do at the moment is to go for the double glazing that does passive solar gain. Um, several of us on the table have this and it is absolutely amazing. One side you feel the warmth, turn it over and you don't feel anything. It allows the energy in and then prevents it from exiting the building. For those of you that are sad, boring technologues like us, then uh, this glass is a low iron, soft coat glass with an argon filling. There you go, it sounds like cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's under various brand names, one of them's Planetherm, um, etc. But it's, uh, it, it's the best you can have, and you don't have to do it all at once, just as they fog, replace them with that. Rather than saying which renewable energy technology should be prioritised, basically saying energy savings should be prioritised. Um, but um, effectively, we're still picking up people who don't know anything about uh, loft insulation, capital wall insulation. Sadly, there are still quite a lot of people out there. Um, there, that's where we should be prioritising. Draft proofing windows, doors, and roofs. Um, you know, they're really easy, cheap wins, um, have a really big impact, and the secondary glazing, various things of that sort. Going on to energy production, um, so we did actually I'll try and answer the question. We completely disagree with our friends over at the other side here and, and look at biomass as being a priority for a number of reasons. Uh, Northern Wales National Park was, until the New Forest came along, the most wooded national park in England. So the resources there for, for local consumption. Um, the fact is that there's, I can't remember the figure, loads of wood going out to Sencor every year, which is burned at 35% efficiency. We should be burning it here locally at 75 to 85% efficiency, or better still, pelletizing it and burning it at 90% efficiency. So, you know, the savings are really there to be had on a local basis, using local resources. Um, we, we like wind at the community scale. Um, so, slightly larger wind turbines, buy-in through the community. The carbon savings per pound are much higher than the other technologies. Um, and the, the, we had a whole list of things about um, financial assessment and whole life costs, which kind of echo, echoed what you were saying about the pounds per kilowatt hours produced as opposed to the pounds per peak kilowatts installed. So a bit, of, a bit more of a feel for the whole life costs of installations, which would then take into account effectively not just the capital costs, but the running costs as well. That was production. Uh, three, what should be avoided? Well, we'll know once that assessment has, has been <laughs> done. Um, four, how important are targets? We just ignored that because we didn't really understand the question. Well, it was really about, you know, why is the question being pitched? Is it because um, government targets um, increase interest in, in Installations, you know, it was a little bit about why targets are needed. Five should subgroups, yes, and again, deliberately, probably heard you subliminally, so deliberately disagreed <laughs> with you. Um, but technology based subgroups are, are more effective because then they would look at a, a, a technology but within an area. I accept your point about the, the um, importance of looking at technologies. Um, across the board for a particular installation, like this building for instance, but um, if you're going to go and try and encourage people to install biomass, you need a group of folk who really, really know about biomass, otherwise um, we're going to end up in a situation with um, a little bit of knowledge being a very dangerous thing. Would you like to say what you were suggesting happen next, because you were talking about 
getting to be yes. together again. Yeah, well, this. What's, that, what's the thought? It's obviously, I'll you know, collate what we've talked about here this evening. Um, and uh, what would be really good, I think, is when this is finished, um, I mean, that some of the things we have suggested are in there about like, community biomass scheme, as in buying together. And, um, but it would be good if people could read it and digest it and, and then come back with some more opinions on, on what they think and perhaps have another feed into either the website or have another meeting, kind of a, a debrief meeting from this particular piece of work on, and how it's going to lead into further work um, and, and the steps that this will recommend. So, so what sort of time scale are you thinking of for that sort of debrief? Uh, well, maybe end of April. Once you've had a rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and once people have you know, had a chance to read it and, and you know, hopefully discuss it amongst the community. Where is it available? Well, it probably will be available on the website. Mm -hmm. Is that the plan? The thought was perhaps Ooh. to to the yes, right. yes. the new one. The new one. When is that going to be up? By next week. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank Kate for the work that she's put in, in sort of pulling all this together, and, um, and the fact that you're not sort of dropping it now. You are going to sort of hopefully help us take it forward a bit. Um, and we wanted to maybe formally finish now, but if anybody wanted to talk about how we were, sort of the SRI Community Energy Group, what we were going to do next.